If you're telling yourself, I'm just going to go do IVF when I'm 43, there is no guarantee that it's going to work for you then. Everyone immediately thinks it's the woman. Even if the problem is the guy, the woman has to do the entire process. Right now, you and I are starting to make sperm, and it's going to arrive in this world in about 72 to 90 days. All right, let's call out male infertility. <laughs> We've talked so much about female infertility on this podcast. I'm hearing so many things behind the scenes about male infertility, and I feel like it's so taboo, and people aren't talking about it because it makes them uncomfortable. We have the chief meat beater back in the studio. <laughs> chief meat beater is back. He's ready. <laughs> All meat be <laughs> beaters are back in the studio. <laughs> He's wearing a t-shirt that says meat beater. <laughs> um, so that is a really important topic. I mean, it is so sad that when there's an idea or a topic of infertility that everyone immediately thinks it's the woman. Um, there is so much involved on the male side. And earlier in my career, um, we used to think that the majority of fertility is female. Now it's basically most of the research has shown like 40% is female, 40% is male, and the other 20%, we still can't figure out why. It's unexplained infertility. What does unexplained infertility mean? Wait, but before that, though, it's, so it's basically even down the line. Male, it's become female. pretty even. Yeah, and okay. the more and more we learn about analyzing sperm and we are figuring out about sperm and understanding that, like, yes, a man who's 90 makes sperm, but it's not great sperm. It's not like, you know, it's flawless sperm. And all these things are popping up. Like the only relationship they have to autism these days is they think that possibly older sperm can increase your chances of autism. You know, these are all things that we are learning as we are evolving in this whole journey of like fertility and learning more about it. Um, so yeah, I think that, you know, men think that no matter what, they're okay. And there's a lot of studies that show around the age of 40, things start to go downhill. And I just always like to tell people, like when they say women after 35, like there's no switch at 35 that turns on in women and there's no switch in men. But as you're getting older, things are going downhill and men aren't having their sperm analyzed once a year to see how they do. And also you could check sperm 30 days in a row and it has a lot of ups and downs every single time you do it. So it's hard to analyze and see where you are overall. Um, but I think it's an important topic. And I think that sperm freezing is easy enough. And because women are going to be freezing their sperm, I'm sorry, women are going to be freezing their eggs more and more in the future. It's something that men should know how to do and have that sperm frozen. Well, let me, let me, well, one, I mean, in terms of a process, it's just, you just go in, meet, beat your meat and you're, I mean, for a man, it's like, it's kind of a no brainer. I mean, especially if you can afford it. But I wanted to ask you a question. I butchered this earlier. I was talking to a doctor friend who won't let me share his name on the show yet. I'm going to try to get him on. And he was talking about sperm tests and he was saying, sometimes the reason the men think they're okay is because the tests aren't basically good enough or involved enough to show that like you may have healthy sperm, healthy count, but there's something called a cap test. Do you know what that is? or maybe I'm saying it wrong, where the sperm doesn't have the right point on the head and it actually can't penetrate the egg. I, I, I guarantee I so put there, there is, I know what you're saying. Okay. But, uh, let me just uh, give it a little bit more info. So there is a test called a sperm chromatin structure assay, SCSA test. It checks behind the scenes. So it checks the DNA's well-being of the sperm. So okay. inside of every single sperm and inside of every single egg, there's DNA. The SCSA test, is the next level of a sperm analysis that tells you, okay, the sperm analysis will tell you if the head looks good, the cap looks good, you call that it's the head, okay. the neck, the tail, if they're looking normal, that's called morphology. The more normal a sperm is, the higher levels of normal morphology you have. And Wait, that's, that test not the standard test that people no. do? Okay. So this, the standard test checks for count, which is called concentration. It checks for volume, which is the amount that you ejaculate. It checks for the motility, which is how well the sperm is swimming. And then it checks for the quality and how normal the sperm looks, which is called morphology. The next level test is called the DNA fragmentation testing, which checks behind the scenes that we can't check by looking. So maybe a stupid question. Why would they not do that full test? Because imagine, so say I did the test and it showed that you're like, hey, that's great. But then there's an issue with the head, as you call it, right? And the head's not strong enough or shaped the right way to penetrate the egg, doesn't it mean the other test is kind of worthless? So the SCSA test is expensive. It takes a while to get back the result. And in the long run, it doesn't really change what we do for people. So let's say your SCSA test wasn't perfect. What are you going to use? Donor sperm? No. 
So if we can kind of get hints from general semen analysis to tell people where we need to start doing some improvements. So if one of those areas, motility or the count or the morphology, the overall look of the sperm doesn't look great, we can start giving people clues of what to do with their diet, to reduce drugs, to do you know all the things that we tell them to do with like excessive heat and stuff to start improving their sperm. And with that, we assume that DNA gets better as well. I one, used more, to... one more stupid question though. If you do all those, say you do the test and you're like, hey, everything looks great, but then the shape is not right and they haven't tested, then do you think it potentially the woman gets blamed even though the man, is that possible? So male sperm does not have to look 100% normal to be considered a normal sperm analysis. So when you ejaculate, and let's say the average is 20 million or more per milliliter, if you look at the 20 million, you only need to have 14% normal looking to be considered totally healthy man. Huh. So we take into consideration that there's a lot of abnormal sperm because there are so many millions being ejaculated. There's a lot of abnormal ones that come out and you just we just assume that they're not going to be good. Men are so disgusting. We've just got millions of these things just flying out. I mean, millions like, of uh, abnormal looking sperm yeah. and we still consider ourselves totally normal. You guys are all disgusting. <laughs> one's abnormal, and my mic is on, you may not be able to hear it in the headphones, but it is on. If one of the sperms that are not considered normal penetrate the egg, or if it's, if it's abnormal, that means it'll never penetrate the egg. So that's a great question. So if a sperm is abnormal, there, whether it's the head, whether it's the neck, whether it's the tail, or anything else about it, or its movement, there's a very good chance that it's not going to make it into the egg the right way. And if it does make it into the egg the right way, and it wasn't abnormal, then that's when we get an abnormal embryo that either doesn't implant, or it implants, and then you have a miscarriage. I have a question that I'm quote-unquote shouldn't be asking on the mic. It's not allowed, but I'm going to ask it anyways. I am hearing from a lot of people behind the scenes that the vaccine is contributing to infertility. And I would love to ask you if you've seen more infertility since the vaccine or if you think that there's any merit to that. I have to say that I don't think there's any merit to that. Okay. And what about miscarriages? I don't think there's much merit there either. So this is just people talking behind the scenes, not knowing what they're talking about. There is definitely true correlation with your inflammatory process of your body, your immune system being a little bit enraged for like a couple of weeks after you get the vaccine. We all saw that. And people, there's women, many, many women, their period fell off schedule and they missed the cycle. So we do know that that happened. And that's probably the small little thing that it does to affect fertility. But I don't think that it affects your overall fertility long term in any way. And I don't think that people should have avoided the vaccines because of that. Now, there's a million reasons I could say right now that maybe avoiding a vaccine or more vaccines is just probably just, in my eyes, not necessary. And I'm over vaccines for COVID, for example. And everyone just heard that. I'm personally just like done with it. I'm not running and getting boosters every single couple of months because the government announced that they're out. Um, (laughs) So anyone who wants to do that can do it. You won't see me in that line. But (laughs) I do not think that there is any long-term effect of the COVID vaccine on your fertility, on your sperm, or on anything long-term at all. I think that it is crazy, though, that people were losing their period from a vaccine. That does not sound... But again, just like I said, like it does... When you got the vaccine... I mean, I got a vaccine, and for like three days, I felt like crap. I got a fever after the vaccine. I never even had a fever when I got COVID, but I got it after the vaccine. So it definitely wakes up your immune system and people and causes some level of inflammation in your body that then goes down when your immune system is kind of waking up trying to fight against something new, but it goes away. Yeah, but losing your period, there's not, that's not like. You know what I found? You can have a flight on a vacation and then you don't get your period that much. That's never happened to me. Hindsight's 2020, and I'm not trying to pass judgment on anybody, but. If, if we are aware of that these responses can happen, don't you think it potentially is not the best idea to do this if you're trying to conceive or if you are pregnant? So we actually tell people if you're about to do an, an implantation of an embryo, do not go get vaccinated right away. So we decided as a clinic, and it was pretty much in medicine, that you should wait at least four weeks after a vaccine in order to do an implantation. Wow. So th- so because of the inflammation response, it's best to wait if you are going to get implant. What about if you're going to do, um, what about if you're just going to freeze your embryos? 
I don't think it has much to do with freezing the embryo. I think it has your body was in a state of kind of trying to settle its immunity. Got it. And not back to normal yet. So we just thought that four weeks is a good amount of time to let people kind of just calm down. So we made that a rule during the time that everyone was getting vaccines. Are you seeing more infertility or less infertility in general over the last 10 years? So we're seeing more. And during the pandemic, we actually saw more, but for different reasons, I think. And you should be aware. Many people were traveling like every week for work. Now that woman is at home. That woman is now not going into the office every single day and she's working from home and she can leave to do her fertility treatment and do whatever she needs to do and not really worry about anything in terms of like missing work. So we started to see people that normally had a really hard time coming in. Oh, you're saying you're saying they were coming. Now they were they coming opportunity yeah, to come during in. the pandemic. Yeah. Okay. During the pandemic, we lost about 25 to 30 percent of our international clientele that came from around the world, mostly Asia. OK, but we were busier than ever. So See? we had an, we had more than a 30. We probably had about a 40 percent increase. And I got to tell you, I think it has a lot to do with many things. Um, first of all, I think people are learning how to do their research much better on where to go and what to do. Sure. There's a lot of clinics that are messing up on embryos and eggs and things like that. And I think people are learning how to weed through those clinics. And at the same time, just being settled in your own town, in your own home, when you have a little bit more flexibility in your schedule, I think opened up a lot of opportunities for people who were not able to do it before. So you're saying potentially it skews the infertility rate because you're seeing a lot more people that you wouldn't have maybe seen when the pandemic wasn't going on. It's almost like people were like, oh, this is a moment in time that I have time to go and do this. So I'm yes. going to do it now. And because of that, you're seeing yeah, more I guess what I'm saying yes. is you wouldn't have seen these patients or known that they were having this issue prior because they wouldn't have come in. Correct. And also over the last 19 years of doing this, I've just noticed now like people talk about freezing their eggs. So whether, let's say we had no pandemic, we would have been busier now and more people would be coming in now than they would in the past anyways, because every year it just gets more accepted. Every sure. year there's more talk about it. Um, I just went to a visit of this like unbelievable new company um, that I was invited to go for like a tour with this organization I'm a part of. And the owner announced, you know, that and they have fertility coverage for all of their employees. Yeah, we have it here too. So it's, inc you know, all of these different uh, places that now have all this coverage, people are have the opportunity and like people are talking about it and people are learning about it. And I get people that call me all the time. Like I didn't have coverage before. Now I do. I want to freeze my eggs or now I want to do and make my embryos. I think it's cool that Olivia Coppel came out and said that she froze her eggs. I thought that was really amazing. And I think the more people that come out and say it, the better. I think anyone that talks about it is doing so much help to society and talking about it just, I think, opens up doors for other people. You know, when I started off doing this stuff like 18, 19 years ago, no one was talking about anything. It was like horrible to say you had infertility and you're doing IVF. And now it, you're smart. You're resourceful. You are a part of society that knows how to get stuff done if you're doing fertility treatment and you're being progressive and smart, I think, overall. And I think it's not looked as a negative at all. I think a lot of people, too, behind the scenes are doing it for insurance just in case. And I don't know if that's the right word, but like just in case something goes wrong in the future, they just want to have that option of having eggs or embryos or sperm on ice. I think that's the smartest thing ever. I think anyone who thinks ahead, having a, you do a million things in your career to make sure that you're successful. I think if you do one thing for your entire family life, of protecting your future fertility, you have done yourself a huge favor for the future. And I guarantee you in the future, as we progress, more and more and more people are going to be freezing eggs, freezing sperm, and freezing embryos. What's the number of children that you're seeing people want? Are you seeing people want more children or less children? More. So what's more? Is that so three or So I think that for a really, four? really long time, I was hearing a lot of people like one and two, but now I'm hearing many people like two and three. And I have heard people say even four. I think people learned after going through a pandemic when your family is pretty much all it comes down to at the end of the day. And it's your family. It's your kids. It's who you have in your life. It's who your immediate family are. And like you weren't going to see strangers left and right, but maybe you were going to see your sister or brother or parents. You know, so I think that we learned a lot about that. And I think that also the world has changed. It's become a scarier place in many different ways. And for that reason, I think people know that family is family. 
There's no stronger bond in the world than your family. All right. I am going on a tropical trip soon. And I actually went on Fashion Pass to rent some clothes. And the reason I do this is because when I go somewhere tropical, I like to add pops of color. And I don't have a lot of pops of color in my closet. This surprises a lot of people. They think that I have a ton of pink. And I really don't. It's a lot of like nude, white, gray, and black. So I went on Fashion Pass and I actually clicked the link to the dresses. And they have so many beautiful like button up blouses that you can rent and then you can send back. And the best part of Fashion Pass by far is that when you're done with it, like when you've worn it and when you've posted it on your Instagram, you can send it back and they take care of dry cleaning for you. So you literally send it back in your pre-labeled bag. They give you it. So you have a pre-labeled bag, you send it back, it gets dry cleaned. It could not be easier. It's a literal dream. So you can go on, you can find brands. Some of the favorite brands that I like on there are For Love and Lemon, Free People, Show Me Your Moo Moo. You can go on, you can shop what you want. You can get all those colorful pieces that you maybe wouldn't buy. And then you can wear it once and be done with it which to me is like so refreshing. I don't want to have a ton of colorful clothes in my closet because I don't wear them enough. So to be able to rent it is amazing. And of course, we have a special discount just for you today. You're going to go to fashionpass.com and use code skinny at checkout and you get $60 off your first month. So you can literally try it for $29. That's unlimited rentals for just $29 with code skinny. Fashionpass.com, use code skinny. Okay, so Zaza just made the transition into a big girl bed. This is like a big deal. I wanted to make sure that she felt like it was really exciting. We did like little balloons in her room. Uh, I like unveiled the bed. It was a whole thing. And one of the things that I needed to do, the first order of business was getting sheets. So for Zaza, I wanted 100% organic cotton thread sheets. I wanted ones that would get softer with every wash. There's nothing worse than getting buttery sheets and then you wash them and then they feel thin, not with bull and branch. Okay. So I ordered her hundred percent organic cotton sheets, the white ones. So good. It's like a set of buttery soft sheets. She's going to be in that bed for like eight hours a night. So it's really important for me to make sure she's sleeping on superior sheets. And these are actually soft grown organic cotton. And it feels like you're literally sleeping on a soft cloud. I should know because getting a toddler to sleep in their bed, you like have to go in there with them. If you're looking for sheets that are made without toxins, free of pesticides and harsh chemicals, these are incredible. I honestly did a deep dive and found out what a lot of sheets are made of. And to know these are 100% organic is a big deal. So make the most of bedtime with Bowl and Branch sheets. Get 15% off your first order when you use promo code SKINNY at bowlandbranch.com. Exclusions apply. See site for details. That's Bowl and Branch, B-O-L-L-A-N-D, branch.com, promo code SKINNY. It pretty much wouldn't be a TSC him and her episode if we didn't talk about Athletic Greens. And I don't say that as a joke. I say it because we take this stuff religiously now. And I know a lot of people are talking about it, but Lauren and I, we have been talking about this for a long time. Athletic Greens, back before they rebranded to AG1, was one of our favorites. But now AG1, that's what they're rebranding as now. I originally gave Athletic Greens a try because... I am somebody who struggles very much so to get my greens and my minerals and my vitamins in. And so I made this a staple. If I could only recommend one supplement, and I've talked about this many times now, it would be this product. This is the one that kicked it off for me. It's so simple to use. Every morning I made it a habit. I simply wake up, pour a huge glass of water and dump a heaping scoop of athletic greens or AG1 now into the water and boom, I get all my prebiotics, my postbiotics, I get my daily vitamins, I get my daily greens. It's just an incredible product. I'm sure many of you have tried it, but if you haven't tried it, now is the time. And here's why. It's got your daily nutrients and long-term gut health protection. It's way more than just greens. It's all your key health products like multivitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and many more working together, adaptogens. It helps your gut and your whole body so that you can thrive. And it's been part of millions of people's mornings since 2010. So this product has been around for a while and it's been tried and true and tested by many high performers. So if you're ready and you want to take ownership of your health, today is a good time to start. Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamins vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash skinny. That's athleticgreens.com slash skinny. Check it out. Athleticgreens.com slash skinny. You mentioned horror stories. 
We've had you on this podcast. This is your third appearance because you're so popular and amazing. Well, thank you. And your thank eyebrows, you for having like, me. Never seen better eyebrows. And you keep oh a God. broom closet down the street if I need to go relieve myself Michael, in the middle of the Michael day. Michael looks like a sad clown today with his eyebrows brushed down. I had to brush him up for you. I knew you were coming in. Um, uh, there, you mentioned horror stories, and we haven't talked about that. There are a lot of horror stories with the profession that you do. I know that you guys take crazy amounts of protocol, which you can speak on. But what are these horror stories that you're hearing, and how can we protect ourselves from them? There's that whole documentary on Netflix, too, that guy that There's came out. quite a few of them. Yeah. Yeah, there was quite a few of them that were self-donating to all of their patients, and that's craziness. Um, yeah, totally crazy. That must blow your mind for what you do when you hear that story. It was just shocking. Like, I just, I don't even know how, like, but then there's sick people everywhere. I mean, I... That's... It's crazy. To, for me as a fertility specialist, I thought it was incredibly crazy um, to hear a story like that, that someone was using their own sperm to inseminate all of these women and all these eggs and doing the crazy things that they did. But in today's world, you know, cutting corners saves dollars certain places, but it also causes disasters. We have my lab director, um, Dr. Jason Barrett, is one of the most talented embryologists with a PhD that I've ever met in my entire life. He is incredibly, incredibly organized and anal, which makes him an amazing director. The protocols that he's put together, um, what I'm gonna knock on wood, like there's been no mix-ups ever, and hopefully will never ever happen, because we have no room for that and no tolerance. We have this double verification process where two people are working on eggs and sperm um, at any time, that and it's always double verification process for every step of the way and we never have more than one human being's egg and one human being's sperm in one workstation in our lab at a time okay and, but but what it, why is the reason that you guys are so dil like diligent on that what what again what have you seen in this industry that's fucked up where you're like i have to so cross my embryologists are very talented people that work on egg and sperm they're the scientists in our lab and they get paid very well Obviously, people don't want to have many of them. I think we have like 16 of them, and some clinics have two. So if there's only two people working, there's no double verification. Two people can't stand working on something, and people are working all the time really fast, and they're trying to move and do everything they can. They're going to have one person's eggs here, one person's sperm here, another one here, another one there. Every single mistake that's ever happened involved an embryologist working on more than one thing at a time together and then got messed up and confused. Have you heard horror stories about people getting the wrong babies implanted? Have you heard about babies getting embryos getting lost? Like what are what are things that people should be looking for? Is there any like you know how when you look for a plastic surgeon, you try to look for double board certified? Is there anything that we can be looking for if we decide to do this to protect um, ourselves? I, I think it's important to do a quick Google search to see what has comes up on the clinic where you're going to be going. Um, I tell everyone, because not everyone lives in L.A. and can come and see me, but people fly in from all over the country to see us, and we arrange for them to do all of their local monitoring in their ho in their hometown so they don't have to be in L.A. for like three weeks, but just maybe like a week or even shorter. But you need to be going to a clinic that is reputable and knows exactly what they're doing. Doing a Google search and calling the five clinics around you to see which one is the cheapest for the egg freezing or the cheapest for the IVF is definitely going to give you an outcome that may not be the best. So you have to do your research on your doctor. You have to make sure that you have a bond and a relationship with the doctor you're going to be working with for months and then going back again two years later for months. These are people that are going to be important. You must also, this is a kind of new on my list, if the team that works with the doctor, like the nurses that answer your calls, or if they're not proactive, if they're not on top of it, if they're not responding to your needs, that's not the right clinic or the right doctor for you. So I think the team of the doctor is incredibly important. The doctor themselves is incredibly important. And the clinic and the lab is equally as important in all of that. So the lab has to be good. If the lab is not registered with the Society for Assisted Reproductive Technologies and does not put their success rates up there, there's that, that's a big red flag right there. Have you guys done certain things with your team to make sure that they go above and beyond? 100%. 100%. So in our lab, um, there are protocols. They even daily 
the location that's in our building that I don't even know where it is, that is under surveillance with cameras, generator backups, seismically tied down uh, freezers, all of these things are checked every single day by individuals in my clinic. Two of them have to go down, sign off that everything looked good, and then they come back. So we so do just that. in case the like the freezer goes all off. All of that. All, like, what, what if one of the freezers had just gone off and no one noticed for like a month? So they're checked physically every single day. I cannot believe, you're not going to say this, but I can say this. You have so many celebrities, like huge celebrities that you deal with, that you have like a vault of people's <laughs> embryos and eggs. Like you have to check them 600 times. Well, we do. Who the hell you got down there? What's going on? He has a lot of situations. We got a lot of interesting people there. <laughs> um, very interesting people. And we have also embryos from from basically when this industry began. So we have, so when... The industry. When, when did like that? Like he's be? saying, you about have, thirty years. You have you wow. have embryos of people that didn't use their embryos or eggs. So we, uh, my senior partners, started the IVF lab where we have now after being in a hospital, in the Century City Hospital, which no longer exists. All of the embryos and eggs and sperm and everything from there converted over to our lab and is being stored by us. And there are about. 30 to 40 doctors in town that only use our IVF lab. So there are a lot, a lot of eggs and sperm and embryos frozen in our freezers. So we have to be extra careful for everyone. You got the jewels. We've got all the jewels, the crown jewels <laughs> of this country. I want to talk about PCOS. A lot of women are struggling with this I see more recently than ever. And I don't know if that's something that you can speak on, but a lot of people are struggling with this. What one, what does that look like? And one, what is the protocol for getting pregnant if you have PCOS? So luckily for you guys, I did my thesis at Cedar sinai Hospital. At that time, my chairman was like the world's biggest guru on PCOS. So I became very, very familiar and I did my own thesis in that topic as well. So polycystic ovary syndrome is an issue where women have abnormally higher levels of male hormones like testosterone. Uh, and as a result of it, that throws their normal cycles completely off. So they grow hair um, easily, like on the chin area is one of the first signals of abnormal um, male uh, uh, hair production. Also, that extra male hormone causes like hair loss in their hairline and in their head. A lot of these women have like these darkness around their neck and under the breasts and under the armpits and all these areas that, and in the inner thighs, areas where kind of skin rubs against each other, it kind of turns brown. And that has to do with insulin resistance. So PCOS has to do with excessive male hormone and insulin resistance. And a lot of these women are also overweight. Not all. This is LA, so I see a lot of the thinner PCOS patients, but those are the underlying issues. And it keeps you from ovulating on a regular basis and it can cause infertility. So there are different things that we look for. Any signal of excessive male hormones. Uh, number two, anyone who has irregular cycles and infertility is one of them. Um, and all these signal, and your ovary also can look polycystic. So a normal ovary, when you look at it, can have about like six to 10 little bubbles on them. They're called antral follicles. Women with polycystic ovary syndrome, their entire ovary is little cyst after another. There's some usually on the edges of the ovary called a, a string of pearls, and they have a look to their ovary that looks polycystic. A couple questions. Just I'm ignorant about this. So number one, does having PCOS mean you cannot carry a baby for sure? Or is there ways around it? Absolutely not. So it has no nothing way. to do with your uterus. Okay, so, so you can carry a baby. So you can 100% carry a baby. Got it. So you may not be ovulating on a regular basis, but you can definitely carry a baby inside your uterus. So if you're not ovulating on a regular basis, that may be why people think they won't be able to get pregnant or carry. Is that that's why ovulation? they think they, they so why. they may not be able to get pregnant, but definitely they can carry. Okay. And with certain medications, there's a medication called Clomid or Clomiphene citrate. We give to patients, it helps them ovulate. It helps a polycystic ovarian syndrome patient, PCOS, ovulate better and actually release an egg. But if you, so if you look and you say, okay, you have too much testosterone and other things, you, the protocols you do to start managing the hormones better to decrease those levels yes. before doing all the other stuff? There are. There are. So you can carry a baby, but you might have to freeze embryos and do IVF. You may. So with, 
a polycyst, a PCOS patient with the injections that we give people to make eggs, they will make eggs. They will make a lot of eggs. Usually they make a ton more eggs than the normal person, but a lot of times the eggs are not of the best quality because they've been exposed to male hormones like testosterone all the time. It kind of makes them sometimes poorer quality. What makes an egg poor quality? Older women's eggs are poorer quality. Okay. PCOS patients are poorer quality. Um, women that don't have a lot of their own hormones, like anorexic women, get poorer quality. Um, all of these things can affect egg quality. And I mean, drugs, alcohol, people that are abusive to their bodies in many ways, they have poorer quality eggs. Okay. So I have not asked you this question. I've asked you about the process of freezing eggs and beating meat. You guys can go listen to that. Go back and listen to any of the old episodes. In, we'll, listen, we'll link it in there if you guys want to know the process. And you do recommend that everyone freezes their eggs, basically. Anyone who wants to have a child, and to be honest, even if you don't, because I've had so many women tell me, I thought I didn't want to have kids, but now I realize when I turn 39 and a half, I realize I do want to have a kid. Well, you and I were talking on the phone and we were talking about Jennifer Aniston and what she's done for this space. What Jennifer Aniston has done is so incredible because she's, and you said this, this is not me saying this. She's one of the only huge celebrities that have come out that said, I wish I had, I wish I had been able to have kids and I, I couldn't. And you know what? Maybe... I got to tell everyone, I, I have never met her and I don't know her and I love her. The fact that she came out and had the first celebrity with a story that did not end well is huge. You know, the fact that she came out and said, I wish I would have done this. I wish my doctor told me to freeze my eggs and I didn't freeze them. And now it's too late is really huge. And I commend her for doing that because she has a voice and people listen to people in entertainment because they have voices and everyone's listening. So I think that we should learn from her mistake of what she did not do at the right time so that many, many, many women in the future will not have to go through that again. And she actually says in this magazine article that she she was told or she thought that you could conceive when you were 40 plus, no problem. And so she just sort of went with that narrative that she had heard. And then when she wanted to freeze her eggs at 40 plus, she had a horribly hard time and she was drinking all the Chinese teas, she said, to do it and nothing was working and she, she I mean she has all the money at her disposal she has all the people at her disposal and she couldn't do it so she so she, because she heard oh I got pregnant at 42 and I got pregnant at 48 she went with that narrative instead of being proactive correct? and I'm going to add this right here we have women that are 32 33 that their eggs are already down the drain so yes we do get women that are 42, 43, 44, 45 pregnant with their own eggs. After that, it becomes almost impossible to get pregnant with your own egg unless it was frozen at a younger age. And if you're looking, if you're telling yourself, I'm just going to do this, I'm just going to go do IVF when I'm 43, there is no guarantee that it's going to work for you then. So she needed to, and women need to, start assessing their fertility in their late 20s or early, early 30s or around 30. Okay. You said IVF. So, so is if the you common have, if the you... common myth is that people believe IVF later you can just go and freeze embryos at forty three and that you'll be fine. It's so sad because there's all these celebrities over the last fifteen years that popped up at the age of forty seven with twins. But okay? you're saying that they did the and, work before. Well, they it, there's a very very good chance that they either froze their eggs when they were much younger or that's an egg of an egg donor. But if let, okay. let, let me ask you this. If let's say you're 30 and you go and you freeze embryos, but you say, ah, I don't want to get pregnant till way later. What's the latest that you can get pregnant with those embryos that you froze? So it varies. So if you are in amazing health and you are still in the same, you know, if everything about your body is good, you're great and you're healthy. I have no problem putting an embryo in someone who's in their 40s. However, they have to be aware that there will be higher risks no matter how healthy you are in your 40s. So high blood pressure pregnancy called preeclampsia, um, gestational diabetes, uh, preterm delivery or labor, all of these things are actually at higher risk when you're older, all of them. So if you have frozen embryos and you're young, when would you say is the best time to implant them? I mean, I know you're going to say the sooner the better. No, but... I'm not, I'm not going to say that at all. I okay. think when you're ready. Well, what so if, I think when you're ready. So but you like could do if it at 38, you could do it at 42. But what you're right. also saying but is I, that I, if I, you're ready at 50, it's, it's too late. 45. I mean, it, listen, for some out. people, 50 is the right time. For me, it's not. And is that what I recommend to patients? Absolutely not. 
Have I had 50 year olds that have come and were in amazing health and that's just their cards that you know they were dealt and that's what happened? Yes, and they did well. Have I had people that didn't go well? Yes. What's the oldest that went well? So in the, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine um, recommends no one over the age of 55 having a baby or carrying a baby, sorry, carrying a baby. So we have had some people in their 50s that did this and it did actually go really well, but that's because I'm, I got to the point of like paranoia and I wanted to say no and the woman's, so I had them do cardiology workups. I had them do OBGYN workup. I had them be counseled by a high risk OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine. So I'm not a fan of that and I would never ever recommend that to anyone. But if you're in great health and you're willing to take all of those risks that come along with that, we're happy to help. Okay, but, but there's a lot of counseling involved before something like that would happen. Here's the thing with Jennifer Aniston that's a takeaway to me. If she had frozen eggs or, or embryos with someone, at least she would have had the option later on. But because nothing was done that was proactive, she didn't have the option. Which Correct. She came out and said, these are her right. words, not mine, was a bummer. And to be very honest, if she was my friend, what I would tell her is that you should not push your dream of having a child aside and the use of egg donors, which are young women in their twenties can allow her to have a beautiful family. Now it's not for everyone. Would she carry? She, I don't know how old she is right now and I don't know what kind of health she's in, I'm gonna look. but she can carry. I mean, there's, if she could carry, I'm not sure if that's the most important thing for her is to carry. It was probably to have a biological child of her own, which is causing all of these issues for her. She's 53. I mean, I don't think it's a phenomenal idea for a 53-year-old to be carrying a pregnancy. I'll be very honest. Taylor, do you want to be the donor? Taylor wants to volunteer. I don't think she wants his. <laughs> I don't know if my if my sperm's good or not. I've, I've always It's always been something I'm curious Could about. Could we live test his sperm on Instagram stories? I'm <laughs> if, not joking If around. I see one thing or anything to do with Taylor's sperm on the no, show, I'll, I'll shut the whole so company down. To so actually... I think what we could do is, just in a very PG-rated way, like if we had the sperm under a microscope okay. and we could video it and we could put that, yes. Let me Wait, ask you so this. Can he, I, can I think Michael's going straight free? to the whole- the... Can Taylor do it for free? I'm Taylor, when's your birthday? August 19th. Yes, you can do it. We will okay, give it so to you as a birthday gift. Okay, let's do that gift. on Instagram yeah. stories. Okay. I'm not joking. Let okay, me, we'll do it. Okay. Back to the males for a second. If I'm all about it. If, <laughs> if, <laughs> He's if, beating it right now as we uh, speak. If men Michael's want to like be... smiling so big, I don't know why. It's very concerning. With a laugh. If men want to be proactive to enhance their sperm or to make it a healthier sperm, what what are the things that you recommend the men do? Because I think we've talked a lot this about- is great. Them. I love that you brought this up and I, we have moved on from there. So thanks for taking this back. Because I mean, I feel like, listen, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're going to tell me I'm wrong, but I feel my gut tells me that the men can do things that are much simpler to do on their bodies to at least get themselves in a position where they have healthier sperm. Well, the difference is that men are, right now you and I are starting to make sperm. And it's going to arrive in this world in about 72 to 90 days. Yep. Okay. okay. Lauren, her eggs have been sitting in her body for I don't know how many years. Since the day she was born, 30 something years, they've been sitting there and there's no new ones coming. So we're cycling every 90 days. Yeah, about 90 days. Okay. So right now, if you and I stop drinking and people, we don't use drugs and we don't... Uh, do anything that's going to take our testicular temperatures up crazy, like jacuzzis and steam rooms and saunas, super tight clothing, you know, that takes your temperature up. We let our testicles breathe well at night and we do everything and eat healthy with antioxidants. What and, about ice baths? I mean, I think that's not good either. Okay. Because anything that's an extreme, your testicular temperature is supposed to be about one to one and a half degrees lower than the rest so of saunas, your body. So saunas, ice baths, if someone's doing that regularly, may not be great I for sperm. I think that anything that changes temperature of your body to extremes is, is probably not good for you. All those self-help guys are fucked. No, well, yeah, I'm... I mean, to be honest, I don't know the data that well on freezing and the ice baths and stuff, but I'll be very, very honest. I can imagine that just as the excessive heat is not good, the excessive cold is probably not good too. For fertility. Yeah. But we're not talking about other things. Just no, fertility. no, I'm not talking yeah, about yeah, anything yeah. else. I'm yeah, sure for okay. your rest of your body, I've heard there's tons of benefits. Okay. so say And obviously not... heat, you just can't take it. So that's why you can't do it. Sure. So say you're not doing those things. Things like, okay, say I come here like, hey, we just looked at, we just looked at your stuff. It is not looking good. I want you to get on this cocktail of supplements, vitamins. I want you to quit drinking. Yeah, I, and like, by the way, stuff. the supplements and we give, the male supplements, there's quite a few of them available. There's a lot of bad ones, but there's a handful of good ones. 
they have a lot of amino acids. They okay. have a lot of proteins. They have a lot of specific things in it that are just good for sperm. Steaks are good for sperm. I mean, I, a good steak right now sounds amazing since yeah, I haven't had lunch. I think that protein is good for sperm. Okay. Like, yeah, proteins help good sperm. Okay. And antioxidants help good sperm as well. Recently, I did air sculpt. You guys know this, okay? I really wanted to try it. I had heard so many good things and I like started researching it and just finding out that this is like a celebrity secret. Okay. So air sculpt is a minimally invasive body contouring procedure designed to permanently get rid of stubborn fat in one session. What I decided to do was my underarms. I felt like there was a lot of hormonal fat. And then I did my love handles. And while I was there, Dr. Aaron Rawlings was like, let's do your jawline. So he did underneath my jawline, like right underneath. And it's amazing. There's no needles. Okay. There's no scalpels at all. And there's no stitches. And it's all while you're awake. <laughs> and the craziest thing is, is I was walking the beach the next day. I had the best experience. I've recommended it to all my friends behind the scenes. And I just feel like AirSculpt is such an avant-garde way of doing things. They're really on the pulse when it comes to cosmetic procedures. So AirSculpt is the answer if you have stubborn fat. So what you're going to do is visit airsculpt.com slash skinny to find out more about receiving a complimentary AirSculpt area with the purchase of one or more areas. So you guys, you could go in like I did for an arm and then walk out with also a jawline, complimentary. I have nothing but incredible things to say about this. I had the best time. If you want to know more, you can check out my highlight on Instagram. It's called AirSculpt. It gives you the whole 360 approach. Visit airsculpt.com slash skinny. After years and years and years of not wearing deodorant, I have found one that is clean. Thank God. It's aluminum free. That was like the most important thing. And it's also dermatologist tested. I also love how this specific deodorant is so easy to travel with. It's like mini. You can throw it in your handbag. You can throw it in your travel case. You can throw it in your cosmetic bag. It is by Nez, a new clean aluminum free deodorant. You've probably seen this all over Instagram. People are going crazy for it. I even saw it on Kim Kardashian's Instagram story. So basically what it is, is Nez is customized for your different sweat moments. So they have like the workout sesh, they have the board meeting, they have date ready. I actually traveled with workout sesh when I was going to Vegas. I just came back and it's so light. It's not like a lumbering, huge deodorant that is super chalky and gets all over your shit. We're over that, right? We've moved on. We've moved on from the aluminum too. So they have all these little moments to take you through your sweating. They also smell really good. But most importantly, and this is important to me, if I am going to wear deodorant, they actually work. Out of all the ones that I've tried, I like the board meeting bright blend. It's like a scent of pear and jasmine, and it's perfect. This one is definitely my favorite one out of all of them. You can visit nezcare.com and use promo code skinny at checkout for 10% off your entire order. That's N-E-Z-C-A-R-E.com and use promo code skinny for 10% off your entire order. The promo code is valid through June 30th, 2020. And like I said, go stock the site, but check out board meeting. It's the best blend. We just came back from a trip to Las Vegas and you know, I packed my snacks accordingly in my bag because when Michael gets grumpy because he's hungry, it's not a pretty sight. So I packed my bags with like apple slices, a little hummus, some carrot sticks, and then of course, perfect bar. Okay, so the one that we're obsessed with and we keep going back to is the dark chocolate chip peanut butter. This bar, you guys, has 17 grams of protein. And it also has no artificial preservatives. It can be stored in the fridge. So I'll just like put it in my purse and that's the first thing that I'll eat. And you can just like have a quick bite. It's all non-GMO. It's all gluten-free, soy-free, kosher, and low GI. And it honestly is so good. The texture is like a cookie dough texture, but like I said, has so much protein. You could also, if you have kids, and what I like to do is travel with the little snack size ones. They're so cute and they have six grams of protein and 150 calories. This is great if you are running errands or you're doing a workout and you want to grab something on the go. They're all made with freshly ground nut butter, organic honey, and 20 organic superfoods. And Perfect Bar knows it will be love at first bite. So for a limited time, they're offering you a chance to try their refrigerated protein bar for free. 
So here's how it works. Sign up for email or text and upload a picture of your receipt from your local grocery store and they'll reimburse you for the cost of one bar directly to your Venmo or PayPal account. All you have to do is go to perfectsnacks.com slash skinny to get a free perfect bar today. That's perfectsnacks.com slash skinny. You get a free perfect bar today. Happy snacking. Okay. Okay. So here's my question. Like We've talked to, we, and I, I kind of said this earlier. We've, L-carnitine. L-carnitine. I've heard that too. Um, we've talked about the process of freezing your eggs. We've talked about the sperm process. What is the process of actually getting things Im- implemented and implanted. Right? implanted in you? Because don't lie, because I have a friend that did this and they said that the needle was 60 feet long and it looks like a baseball bat going up your ass. So I want the, <laughs> don't tell me the like PG version. I want the actual real version of what it is like to do IVF, the process from start to finish. Okay. So well, if you market it as a baseball bat going up your ass, I assume no. that the fertility I mean... rates are going to skyrocket. <laughs> <laughs> I just got you fucked. <laughs> I want the real, like the real info. Don't tell me that it's Why like... does he have to always take it there? He just always takes it to the next level that like nice me. little doctor here is like blushing. Um, okay, Michael. I only say half what's in the body. <laughs> I could just imagine. So <laughs> you want me to start from the beginning and like in every level, I'm going to tell you what needle is involved. Okay. From literally the start. So, so, so say you have embryos on ice, okay. ready to go. What do so, you do? Someone's called me. They did their consultation. They are ready to go. The way that this begins is they're going to call me the first day of their period, and they're going to come into the clinic on day two of their period. And if everything looks good on day three, we can start injections. Injections are tiny little needles. They are like, if anyone's ever seen an insulin needle, that's what they look like. It's as thin as a hair, a thick hair. And that's the needle that's going to go, you're going to pinch your belly, get some fat, and it's going to go right into the fat in your belly. It is a subcuticular, meaning it goes right underneath the skin, and it's not going anywhere further. Most, the biggest phone call we get is that patients feel like they're not getting the injection and they're concerned. Because it's so small. It's so small. Like, And we can tell them and reassure them that your blood levels are going up, your estrogen levels are going up, your follicles are growing nicely, they are growing and you're doing well. So that's what we tell them, and that's perfectly fine. Um, those are the needles that you're going to do all the way through for 10 to 12 days until the eggs come out, okay? When the egg is coming out and you are completely knocked out, I'm not sure if your friend was awake for her egg retrieval, but the needle that goes, there's an ultrasound that goes vaginally. No, she was not awake. She said that there was needles before she got implanted that were insane and she sent me a picture one and it looked like uh, i mean so when your eggs when your eggs are coming out of you you we put you under a light sedation that lasts between like three to ten minutes it was after that after she's getting her ivf so during that process of the egg retrieval which you don't feel and you don't know at all what's going on you are totally knocked out and you wake up and it's all done There is a needle that goes through the ultrasound machine and the tip of it goes into the ovary and it's a hollow needle. So the eggs come out and there's like fluid that goes through that needle into a piping and it goes into a little test tube that my technician is holding next to me. And then that tube is passed on to the person in the lab under the microscope. They check it and see, oh, there's an egg there. They put the eggs all together in a little dish. So that needle that no one ever sees is the only big needle in this. Then we put the egg and the sperm together and we let, allow them to incubate and for embryos to grow. As the embryo grows for an entire week, at the end of that week, we do a biopsy on the embryo and we freeze the embryo. That little biopsy is going to let us know if your embryo is genetically healthy or not. And about a week later, we get the genetic testing results and then we tell you how many genetically tested normal, healthy male and female embryos you have if you want to know the gender or else we conceal it from you. When we are putting the embryo back in, it's called the frozen embryo transfer process. It's the implantation process. There is a needle that is maybe about three quarters of an inch long. And it's the injection of progesterone and oil that needs to go into your butt is that uses needle that she needle. Says, she texts me. That's probably the needle that she's referring to. But it's a butt to. shot. Hey, but it's what? a shot in the butt. It looks like it hurts. Admit it. That's the only needle that kind of hurts. And how long do you have to do that needle? You have to do that needle for probably around four to six weeks. Oh, in your ass every day. Once a day. But then it goes to like every other day. And then you, but this is how we tell people to do it. You take like a cold 
can of Coke or something or anything An cold. An ice roller. Anything. An ice roller. Wait, you need Richie, ice rollers. You ice roller. No, I'm not joking. You need ice rollers in your office. They should be using ice rollers. I'm not sure. That's a really good idea. idea. We sh- so you ice up however way, especially with an Might ice roller. Might as well roller. get a business thing going here. hundred percent. We roller. should make a bigger one. Great. Let's make a okay, huge one. Okay, let's make a huge uh, one. Make it as big as a you bat, want. A bat. A bat. Let's go. Make Come on, Michael. Let's make it a bat. A okay. baseball bat What are we going to do with that? We don't know. Michael will definitely tell us what I'll we're doing with it. Ass, an, yeah, Taylor, Taylor, Taylor come by and ass roll. I'll come over and ice roll these asses. <laughs> yeah, that's his dream. Taylor ice roll. will freeze his penis and use it as a cold compress. <laughs> yeah, that's Taylor O'Connor's dream to go and freak, <laughs> ice roll a bunch we're of asses. We're going to have a mold of his penis made that you freeze it and then you just hold the... Wow. That's like a Cornish in though. That's yeah. like that. Okay, so <laughs> Okay, so if you but you're saying if you freeze it up, you numb so it. If you numb it for like five minutes and then that shot just goes right in and you come out. Then you take something warm and rub it. You rub it around. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor's on the fucking case. Because you don't want the oil to sit as a lump in your butt. This sounds like a lot of work, This, this is a serious topic, it. guys. You've you got to do a huge needle, and then you have to do oh, something warm. This is like so it's, 20 it's, minutes. No, it's like five minutes and five minutes. You okay. put five minutes something cold, you give the shot, and then for five minutes, you kind of just rub around there. Okay, and then that's it? That's it. So the, Because when the oil, if you just give the oil shot and you leave, it's going to sit there as a lump. And that hurts. And it, it hurts. Yeah. If you don't rub it around, it doesn't go into the muscle, it's going to hurt. As long as you're like rubbing it and it goes into the muscle, it doesn't hurt that much. If someone's so scared of needles, like if I were to ever do this and I'm so scared of needles, like what do you do for someone who's petrified? Do, can they go in your clinic and get it? Can a nurse come to them? or is so, it... but All of the above. So we yeah. have a service that you can come to the clinic every day and get your injections there. Um, or nurses go to your home. We We have all of that. Okay, or so, we usually teach the spouse because that's a hard one to give to yourself. The spouse? Uh, Learn, I'm on it. Don't worry. Okay. Get that roll the ass, <laughs> jab, the hot massage con- with the hot <laughs> oil. Tea bag. Yeah. Sounds like a normal day in our, in our house, honestly. It's just <laughs> annoying to me because the guy literally does nothing. And it's it's just, it's very frustrating to me. You know what? What? This world is different. I mean, everyone's uh, there's things that guys have to do that girls don't. There's things that girls have to do that guys don't. I mean, this is this is how it is. I mean, this is life. Okay. It's I get it. Because... I get it. In this process, I do feel bad for the woman cuz even if the problem is the guy, they and still have to do it. Once this. in a while we have a guy that has Ooh. really low sperm count and you cannot get pregnant with anything but IVF. The woman has to do the entire process. Yeah, That's and you know, really... it's hard as a man because you have to listen to these women bitch all the time. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. I'm just kidding. I'm going to announce I have a lot to say right now, and I'm not going to. Okay, so after you've done the bat needle for <laughs> the time, then you have to do another surgery, correct? It's not. No, 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 no. no. There is only one three to 10 minute procedure, which and is the egg you're retrieval. Awake. No, but you're, you're, you're awake for the um, implantation. The, the implantation is painless. Okay. Painless. There is no needle involved at all. And you just lay there and you just... You just lay there and the paps... It. Exactly. So, Is it really like what you're turkey-based? Yeah. But well, it's not the, body, really a, the body's been prepped, right? So your body... We started those injections five days earlier. So your body thinks you ovulated five days ago. Okay. We have already incubated and grown an embryo for five days. That's totally normal. Okay. And that day we thought... So the body thinks it's been growing in the fallopian tubes. Okay. And doesn't know it's been sitting in the freezer for a few years or okay. a month or whatever it may be. And then we load it... So the embryologists on our TV screens will show you as they load that up into a catheter. And about three seconds later, they walk through the door and they hand me the catheter. And the catheter goes through the cervix up. It's soft like a spaghetti. It's like a cooked spaghetti that's soft. It just goes up. I push the end of it just to release and inject the embryo. And it just goes right into the uterus and sits there. So you can see the person getting pregnant on screen. Yes. And then and then after that, and I think this is important for people that don't know, you do have to go on bed rest, correct? No. No. So we don't do that anymore. Okay. Studies showed that women that went home and laid there for two days and did not move at all started to have lower pregnancy rates than if you go home and what I call lounge around for two days. Okay. So you watch some of your favorite funny shows. Okay. You eat really well. You can lay in bed. You can lay on your sofa. You can sit on the sofa. You, you peg can your sit husband at the up table. the ass because of what you just had to experience. <laughs> <laughs> Bend the fuck over, bitch. It's my turn. You start beating your husband with a bat. 
<laughs> okay, so and then when do you know for sure if you're like 100%? 10 days after that implantation, okay. you do a blood test and we can tell you if you're pregnant or not. And what's the percentage of it actually taking? It varies tremendously. Okay. In the United States, the average is something between like 30 and 40 something percent right now. Um, our clinic, it's between 76 to wow. 84 percent. Wow. That's amazing, Dr. Gadir. I didn't know that. That's a huge difference. Yeah, it so is. So that's why people fly out. So that's why people fly out. That's why people go out of their way. That's why we have an insane protocol for everything to do everything the best. Along with all those safety protocols, we have a million protocols that actually help the process as well do well. This is my So it's last... not only the safety one, but there's a lot of things that we do just to make this whole process as perfect as possible. Use the best materials, the best mediums, the best catheters, the best freezers, everything. This is my last question. It, do you think it's smart for someone who wants to do IVF to implant more than one embryo just in case? Or is that an old school way of thinking? It's an old school way of thinking. So if you want to have a larger family and you would like to have twins and you are healthy and you are aware of all of the risks that go along with having twins, then I would say you could put two embryos back. I never put more than two embryos back. And if you are just putting two embryos back to increase your chances of being pregnant, that's not a good thing to do. You're saying you never go beyond just, you don't go to triplets. Never. Never. Well, just curiosity, why? Because it's not safe okay. and it's not healthy. And no woman was made to carry triplets. And triplets will 100% deliver early. And the earlier they deliver, you're going to have more problems with your kids with all the issues that come up with preterm babies. Do a lot of people do twins now? Um, less and less every day. Huh. So it used to be a lot of twins. And everyone saw everyone walking around with twins. But nowadays, it's become much, much, much more one at a time. Why so? Because that, maybe that old Because there's thinking. a lot of people that don't want to have twins. There's, it's high risk. It, there's a lot involved. Um, not everyone has help. Not everyone has resources to help them afterwards. So there's a lot of reasons. And it, it's, there's a lot involved. Um, but there are some people that want to have bigger families, and they've suffered from fertility issues, and they're okay with it. And you have twins, and you love it. I have twins, and I love it. My twins a week from today are going to be turning seven. I'm oh. sorry, not seven. They're turning 11. Oh, my God. Yeah, they're turning a... 11. Oh. Yeah. A <laughs> <laughs> couple, couple birthdays off. We are the best friend. We know how to count perfectly. Taylor, can you edit that, please? Okay. <laughs> my twins are turning exactly a week seven, from today. Seven, 11. 11, 11 years old. It's whatever. Um, and they are the joys of my life along with my other two kids. And there is nothing in my life that gives me as much joy as my kids do. Um, and it's there's nothing in the world that's a harder job. And I commend my wife because there is no job harder than raising kids. <sighs> Amen. 